All right, here we are again, my friends. Welcome to Big Steve Backstage Pass. We take no turn left unstoned here, just like we always do. Today, I want to talk about when I first really started bonding with Jerry in an amazing way. And I was so lucky to have this opportunity. I've told you about my meeting with Ramrod and how that opened me up to the crew and to be part of it all. And Jerry was always around with us. You know, when we were working at Alembic in San Francisco for Owsley and all working there and building the PA and learning, Jerry hung out there with us every day. And we smoked the best weed. We were smoking ice bag, which was incredible pot. So flavorful, so strong. And the airplane had a lot of it. And so Jack Cassidy would hang out with us every day. And Ramrod and I would be down in Alembic hanging out. And the band was coming in there, in and out. You know, all the bands in the Bay Area came down there, talked to Owsley about their equipment. So you had, you know, Chipolina and the Quicksilver people and the airplane people with Paul Kantner and, and Jack Cassidy and Yorma. Grace would come by. It was like a place. And we'd also stop off. Whenever we left the city from Alembic, we'd stop off at the airplane house, which was on Fulton Street. And that was incredible, man. We'd play pool there with Bill Thompson, who was the manager, really good friend of mine, managed the airplane, and was one of the major people in the start of the whole Bay Area music scene. So many people in the scene. We're going to do a whole show about all the people. But let me talk to you today about how Jerry and I bonded so strong. So it was an afternoon where we were standing in front of Alembic. And uh, I had a 51 Cadillac that I bought from Ramrod for 100 bucks, And it was pearlescent green, beautiful. And so we were looking at it. Ramrod and I were talking about it. Jerry pops out from behind us in a, a, a Alembic studio and he's got his guitar. Uh, he was the Stratocaster that he got from Graham Nash uh, a few months earlier as a present. And we thought at the time it was a 58, but it was a 55 Strat. And so Jerry had that with him. And then Ramrod had his amp, which was a Fender Twin Reverb, his favorite one. And it was had a tie-dye front. We would take the old Fender speaker protector cloth out and put tie-dyes on all our stuff at this time. So it was very distinctive and beautiful looking. And so Jerry and I began to talk and Ramrod, and he says, would, what do you, would you guys take my stuff over to the Matrix? I want to play with Howard Wales. Howard Wales was a keyboard player. He was in a band called AB Sky. This is a picture of him and Jerry way early on in those days. And uh, Jerry's holding up a copy of Scientific American Magazine as a joke. But these two guys really hit it off. And so Jerry was going to sit in with Howard Wales at the Matrix, which had been owned by Marty Ballin's dad, and was a, a San Francisco landmark. He's about the first guy that would let hippies play in his club. And so that was an iconic place to everybody. And so to go to the Matrix was exciting. To go with Jerry was exciting. To meet Howard Wales was exciting. Because Howard Wales was known as Howie Wowie to us. Because he was, he's dead now, and I can talk about this. Oh, boy, he would not want me to say any of this in the day. We were very clandestine because it was so illegal to move marijuana and to bring marijuana. And he brought it in from Mexico. These incredible pot that we called Michoacan, Sinaloa, uh, after all the states of Mexico where they came from. And it was incredible. It the flavors of his weed and the beautiful, Jerry just loved it. Their seed caps would be orange, the weed lime green, 
the high exhilarating, man, so powerful that people thought that we were giving them some kind of a drug when we took it on the road and they smoked that, what we called Howie Wowie. It was just fine Mexican weed. And Howard would tell us stories all about it. And, and he was so cool in that way, but he was also a great musician. And he would do this thing called pressure drop because I took care of his organ, as it turns out. But that night, Jerry was playing with him, and the pressure drop was when he shut his organ, his B3 down and then started right back up. And it was a really cool thing and stuff like that. He was innovative and very much an improvisationalist. Jerry loved jamming with him. Now, this day comes, and Ramrod had just met a gal named Francis, and he wanted to go home. So he looked at me and he said, can you help Jerry? And I said, sure, of course. And Jerry looked at me and said, you do this for me, Steve? Wow. He acted like he was such a great favor, but it was made at that moment, I became the luckiest man in the world because we were forming the Grateful Dead crew. So I was at all the Grateful Dead stuff. Now I'm going with Jerry to everything he does other than Grateful Dead, which was every night, every day. He played with this guy right here, John Kahn, also. John Kahn was, was there that night at the Matrix. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit and tell you about what that was like that day. It was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and Jerry said, let's go over there, Steve. So we drove over to the Matrix, and we parked out front, banged on the door. Now, Marty Ballin's dad had just sold it to this guy, and he it was his really his first week there. And the place was closed up, but he came, he was in the back doing something. And he came out and opened the doors, the front doors. And Jerry and I, he knew Jerry. He didn't know me at the time, but Jerry said, we're, hey, we're here for the show tonight. We're playing with Howard. And wow, you know, it's one o'clock, he says. But he knew Jerry. It was okay. He let us in, in the dark. Didn't turn the lights on. He took off and said, I'll be back in about an hour. So in this nightclub at night, in the afternoon, it was pitch black, except we cracked the door. I went out to get the amp and guitar from my car, and I left the door open, just a little crack. So a beam of sunlight was shining back in to this dark room. And when I came back with that guitar and amp, I looked over, and there was Jerry sitting at a booth in the middle of the floor of the club and in the dark room around him that beam of light from the cracked doors was making him glow with an unworldly glow man an otherworldly glow and i just had this moment of wow who is this guy i knew him we'd smoke together over at lambic lots in the afternoon he'd come by I'd even, you know, when we were recording, there were times that he even let me come to his house and I crashed on his floor with, with, with Mountain Girl. And, and so, you know, he was a great guy and generous and he knew me. But now we begin to bond from that moment on when that light was on him. He looked at me as I came in and I sat down, opened his guitar case and plugged the amp in. I found a place to plug it in and and stretch it over to him with a long cable that he was playing a quarter inch Belden. We made all our cables at Alembic out of Belden wire, 7291. And that coaxial cable reached to the amp and we figured that out. And then he started tuning up and playing and showing me and just talking little stuff about the guitar. Ramrod had been showing me stuff and I watched him change the strings <clears throat> for Jerry. Now I'm learning from Jerry himself. And he starts explaining stuff to me about the twin reverb. And then when he starts playing where he liked, he began to just play all these different songs. And, and we got into a little game so quick. He started playing a song, and then I, I would try to name the tune. And he picked up on that, and he tried to stump me. He kept trying to play all these songs, and I was doing pretty good because my whole life I'd grown up with music around me. You know, it was part of our thing. And then... Uh, he, he said, when he ran out of ideas, he said, you know, come on, name some songs. I'll see if I can play them. So I said Stardust to him. Now, Stardust was the words, the lyrics were written by my uncle, Mitchell Parrish. And I tell that to Jerry, and he couldn't believe it. 
He said, that's my mother's favorite song. She played it all the time. And, and she played it on the jukebox in the bar where they lived when he was a kid by the next to the Maritime Hall in San Francisco. It was a sailor bar. It was a tough bar. And Jerry's dad had passed away and him, his brother Clifford or Tiff, as he was called by Jerry, couldn't pronounce his name. They lived up there. And Jerry would tell me about playing that song on the jukebox all the time. His mother loved it. It made it made her mourning as they were making breakfast down there in the bar and these rotten, mean sailors were coming in there in those days. Jerry was born in 1942. He was eight years older than me. But we began this bond. And so we were sitting there talking about Stardust and his mom. And he started telling me his life story. I started telling him mine. And we realized we had a lot of stuff in common from even there being an age difference. Plus, we were both very intelligent. I'm not trying to say that for an ego reason, but we were able to discuss things on a high plane. And so we went immediately. I said to him, we started talking about movies because he and I both had been sort of insomniac kids and we were rascals sneaking around. He, Jerry starts telling me about growing up in San Francisco and being a complete juvenile delinquent, doing some of the same stuff that I did when I was a kid. In other words, you know, like stealing our friend's father's car and smashing it into a, a post in the garage. He did that with his, him and his, his brother did that with their grandfather's car and hit the garage post before they even got out the door. Me and a buddy of mine, Henry Schuster, did the same thing with his dad's car in a garage, and we hit, the, we smashed it before we even got out of the, uh, the um, garage. So we were laughing about that, and, and we started talking about metaphysical things and getting high. We rolled a joint. And we started talking, he started explaining to me about Howard Wales and all the amazing music he was involved in. And then he begins to tell me about who was going to play there that night. And that was Howard Wales, John Kahn on bass, who was from Mike Bloomfield and had played on Super Session with Al Cooper and Super Session 2, to be exact. And he was a great bass player, man. And Jerry just loved the way he played. But he didn't know him until that night, too. We both met John that day. And Bill Vitt was another friend of Khan and Howard's, and he was playing drums. So that combo with Jerry added in was what was happening. And... Jerry began to teach me so much about what the show was like and what we were going to do playing in the nightclub and, and explain about how you, you know, behavior in a club would be. It was so new to me, everything. And I've been in, in nightclubs, but this was a whole new angle to come into it. And then we're so there early in, in the afternoon. And so we kept uh, talking about movies and different stuff and amusing ourselves. And I mentioned to him Rondo Hatton. Rondo Hatton was so uh, 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 an old movie actor of the 30s and 40s who never needed to wear makeup to play in horror movies. He had suffered from agromegaly, which is a, we both knew this, both of us did. So I realized Jerry was a, a buff like I was about movies. So we had this other thing in common now. And we're talking about, and that lasted us our whole lives together. I didn't know that at that moment I was going to spend my life with him. And I realized how lucky I was to have that one thing again now. Here, the thing with Ramrod, when I just helped him unload that truck, it opened up everything to me. Now this opens up the highest level to be with Jerry and to be close with him. We spent just about every day together until he passed from that moment because we would do Grateful Dead together. We'd do any other project he did. I ended up doing it with him. Ramrod would come with us a lot until he was sure I could handle everything. And he taught me so much. He was so generous, Ramrod was. And he gave me over the precious gear to take to the Jerry gigs that he wanted to do with playing sitting in with everybody this led to the jerry garcia band you see it evolved to become that but before it did that night now there's a shot of merle saunders who we'll get to in a minute but 
that night it was Howard Wales's night, and he shone, and we smoked his weed. Merle didn't come till a little later. We'll get to that, but Howard was incredible. And his stories about music, he played in a band called uh, The Green Man. He, he played uh, in a, on a song called The Bird, Bird, Bird is a Word. I didn't like all that association, but he was born in Milwaukee and he had a lot of information about music that Jerry just loved to hear his stories because he always would say, I'm a Midwest cat. Yeah, that's right. And he smoked those joints with us and he was a great resource for fun. And that night when he got there and he just, I started learning and listening to these guys and, and I was there with Jerry. So I got a lot of respect from everybody and I became really fast friends with all those guys. Howard and I became close. I started going over to his house and smoking with him a lot in the afternoon. And I became really close with John Kahn. We started going and having lunch together all the time. We all were centered in Marin County at this time. And so everybody lived up there and around San Rafael, where we had our Grateful Dead office moved from San Francisco. And everything was now up in Marin County. And Bill Vitt lived out in West County, a little further out up in Lagunitas, where we were all moving in that direction. Because Rucka Rucka, where we lived with Weir, the crew guys, that was in the Casio. And then you came right down into Fairfax and then down the Miracle Mile to San Rafael. It was our stomping ground. We played in a, a club called the Lion's Share up there. But here we are in San Francisco this day, and this incredible gig comes out, and the improvisation was great, and they had such a great time that Jerry and Howard bonded really strong that night at the Matrix. And what that evolved to immediately was Howard bringing some, he said, oh, he told Jerry, Jerry and I went over to his house a few days later to get some weed from him. And he start, they started talking about putting a band together with Howard fronting it a little bit, but calling it Hooter Roll. That was, Howard came up with that name, Hooter Roll. And it would be a band of Midwest cats, he told us, with Jerry. And so he had a guy named Ginger come in to play drums and a guy named Jelly Roll on bass. Jelly Roll was Roger Troy, was his real name. And he was a trip, man. There was another guitar player, named Jim and he was a rhythm guitar player and Ginger was a good drummer and I you know, took care of all the gear pretty much all of it Howard showed me about his B3 a B3 is such an essential instrument you have to learn it to be a great roadie and so the B3 became something that Howard began to teach me about and I always needed to know it Pigpen was also playing a B3 and the Grateful Dead and so I got to take care of him because of another reason, because I promised him I would never dose him. Everybody was dosing him on acid all the time, pig pen, because they wanted to keep him from being alcoholic, which they thought he was. They thought it was a cure for alcoholism, which it is actually, but that wasn't his main problem. He had some other health problems, but anyway, the B3 Howard's teaching me about John uh, showing me about bass stuff and Bill Vitt had a nice funky set of drums and I was learning to play drums from Mickey Hart at this time too and Billy and so I used to start when the afternoon when Jerry and I would come even in those days I would start working out on drums because Bill Vitt was real generous with letting me do that and Jerry started you know playing and so we then Shortly, it wasn't very long after that now that we go out on a tour where it was, uh, it was actually a while later. We did lots of gigs around the Bay Area and getting down with this little combo. But it now switched to Jelly Roll and Ginger and Jerry and Howard. And that Hula Roll was the center of it right there. And Howard keeps they saying he wants to go on the road. He wants to try to take it out everywhere. And so Jerry consented. Sam Cutler helped us plan the tour. And Sam and I went out with Jerry and Joe Winslow, who was a new 
down from Pendleton was helping me on the on that road trip because we had to drive, we had to pick up a rented truck, fly in, get our gear loaded in that truck, and then drive around the whole East Coast. And it was a great learning experience because here I was, there was no ramrod and nobody else, but me and Jerry one-on-one to take care of all the gear. Joe was there to help me do driving. He was basically as a truck driver and a helper to load stuff. So taking care of the gear was my thing. And I got into it learning from Khan about his setup. Everybody played fenders mostly at this time. And so John had a basement amp and uh, he played a dual showman cabinet, two of them. Bill Vitz drums were what I would call a little bit on the funky side because, he, you know, he needed money to keep buying heads and sticks in those days. So he had to be a working band. He was a little bit laid back and he did other things that were so much fun. What a great guy he was, man. I miss him. And, you know, it even got to the point where he would get so in these early days when the bands were playing, especially when Merle and Jerry were playing, it would get to be like, you know, two o'clock was the cutoff time in San Francisco nightclubs. And so in the Keystones, which I'm going to tell you all about and how they formed, Freddie Herrera, who owned them, and he built those clubs, or he, he designed them just for Jerry and Merle to play in. Before I get to all that, though, we go on the road with Hooterol, and it's now Jer- uh, Jerry and the, and the Midwest Cats, as I call them, and me, and his guitar at the first show, the Mahavishnu Orchestra opened for us at the uh, in Boston at the, not the music hall, it was the Orpheum in Boston, I'm pretty sure. And it was this club, uh, the theater that we played at before with the Grateful Dead. And uh, Jerry stepped out on stage with that Stratocaster that he'd gotten from Graham Nash. And it was a cold winter's night in November uh, in Boston. And so when he strummed the first note, he screamed my name and it just went through me like a, what? Jerry's in trouble. I look at him. He, he had hit the first note and the guitar cracked. The pick guard cracked. The thing that holds the guts in of the guitar cracked. And the guts of the guitar were all hanging out. And he was still plugged in with his quarter inch into his amp and it was working still. So we have something called gaffer's tape. Ramrod had taught me, this is our buddy. This is our friend. In any emergency, we use it to tape things down to amps because things like bass cabinets could easily walk. They vibrate. You put anything on top of them, a guy would want to put it down and drink, put down this thing. You had to make sure to put something that it wouldn't move around. So gaffer's tape, we used all the time for taping cables down, for making harnesses, for doing all kinds of stuff. So I ripped three strips and stuck them on my leg and went out there. And Jerry didn't even miss a note. I got on my knees to him and I slowly tucked all the wires back and put the plate back, pushed it up in the guitar. He never stopped playing. And then I taped it with the strips of tape to hold it in place tight put one around the whole thing, uh, two or three, four, five strips around it. And then he finished the set. When he came back, we were bonded in a way that I call the welding point between a roadie and his musician. So he then right there had the trust in me as he's showing me right there with that picture, uh, you know, and, and, As the years went on, we became so close because I ended up doing his gear and everything in the Grateful Dead and everything he did. And I'm telling you, it was so amazing that night to be that far away from everybody else and to have come through with flying colors. The next day, I made a whole new plate for that thing out of masonite. It's all I had. And I, I, I screwed it in place, and it stayed on that guitar for years. 
until finally that guitar became known as the alligator because in Europe 72, that was, see, Jerry was a one guitar at a time guy. And so he was playing that alligator guitar for those early years of me working with him a lot. And he played it almost exclusively. He did play other guitars at times, but he was one at a time guy. And so he loved that guitar. And when we were in Europe 72, we had already received what became the wolf and we brought it with us. Jerry tried playing it a few times on Europe 72, but even at rehearsals, it would pop strings, pop a or high E string would break. We didn't realize there was a burr on the saddle that was making the strings break. But so he used that a lot, that guitar. And when Sonny Heard went out, he was crewing with us on that trip helping Candace on the lights, actually, because he was kind of out of the picture due to personal problems with other people. That was always happening. People were coming and going, too. And so Heard uh, went out shopping. He comes back with that sticker, and he stuck that sticker. We put it right on that guitar where it is to this day. I just saw it two days ago when Andy Logan, the guy who bought it, is a good friend of mine, and he owns that guitar and Jerry's Martin guitar. And he brought that uh, to the show that we did at the Sweetwater the other night. And uh, Jeremy played it while I sang with them. And it just made me feel so at home to see that guitar. It's ironic that I, at the end of Jerry's life, he called me up and he said, Steve, bring me the... Um, alligator guitar he wanted to sell it it was his guitar he had been given it and he wanted to get sell it but he died a couple of weeks later we never had a chance so when he was dead i had that guitar with me i was very honest and i knew it belonged to the estate and i handed it into them i've thought about that a few times almost wishing i should have kept it but, you know, guitars and instruments, Jerry was teaching me, as Ramrod was too, and everybody, Bobby. Oh, in the Grateful Dead, we had such great respect for our, the instruments and the drums and the organs and the keyboards and the pianos. We learned to deal with all of them. And we were such a great thing because everything was love of instruments, man. Jerry... Loved it. There's a great shot of the Tiger guitar. Doug Irwin worked at Alembic. At Alembic, you could learn anything. If you went to the basement, there they were making these guitars. That's going to be a whole other show, guys. We got so much to talk about. And, you know, part of it is that you and I will get together anytime that the Big Steve Hour will come on at 420 in the afternoon. You be there and we're going to explore the nooks and crannies like never before. Plus, illustrate it with pictures that I can't always do on the radio. I can show you what I'm talking about. It's really cool. And there's so much to tell you guys. You know, Jerry and I got so close over this working arrangement and being there reliable to him. He couldn't even, he said one day to me, I can't explain it, but I don't think I can do a show without you. It was a big thing for him to say that to me because he was a humble man. And he, he always thanked me. That's one thing about Jerry. He always said, thank you. Uh, really, almost every show. He was like that. Not uh, many other people do that. They think they're paying you or whatever, this or that. No, he was very personal to who was helping him and he loved it and if you did things right he let you know if you did things wrong he let you know he was no pushover you know but this is a shot of us here in Kauai. we became so close later on way later on when i suggested to jerry i go he was he got ill and we took i said we, we never take a vacation let's take a vacation and so we would get our families together and go there's trixie holding my daughter lauren in that picture when she was a baby and so we did everything together and uh, it led and it'll all be explained to you guys. It led to me being the best man at two of his weddings. It led to me being in you know, a very hard thing to do was to give the eulogy at his funeral. It fell on me to do it. And 
I would never let this man down. I could never let him down. I just loved him so much. And it was a mutual friendship that kept it going. And I was so lucky and I knew it. And it opened so many great doors, so many wonderful people, so many things happen. And we're going to share all that on these shows. I'm barely touching this the tip of the iceberg here when I talk about these relationship with Jerry and the Hooter Roll tour was a learning experience. It was, it was really something. And we had so much fun. I could tell you stories from there. You're going to have to get a copy of my book and read about some of them. But in there, I talk about what happened on that tour. You know, when we went out with Howard, um, it was never a dull moment, never a dull moment. And, you know, you learned from everybody that came in contact with us. They were all really great people. You were learning about music. You could learn about making guitars. You could learn about fixing amps. You could learn about anything you wanted to, PAs, mixing sound. You know, it was Owsley that invented monitors, man, when he turned one around at the Fillmore. Plus other things I'm going to talk about in the gear episodes. So much about what we did and what made us tick. I think this might be enough for today, you know. Um, I want you guys to participate in this thing. I'm going to start putting up funny little videos, and we're going to add to this joy of life, man. This is what this is about, the joy of life, the celebration of Jerry, Grateful Dead, the camaraderie that the crew and band had, and the whole beautiful thing that was happening in those days and still is going on. It's about connecting to the future. All this stuff. God, I love you. I love all of you so much. I want us to really make this a special get-together thing here. To be continued, my dear friends. To be continued.